Uh, okay, we're live. Um, I can see it now. <laughs> oh, sweet. You can see it now. Okay. All right, right, we're there. Um, so I'm going to do an introduction. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah, here we are. All righty. Okay, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for your patience. Um, Omari and David are already on the screen. Uh, there was a bit of an issue with our tech there. Um, so welcome just a little bit late to our third episode of our interview series, Playwright to Playwright, where we pair an earlier career writer with a Canadian playwright that has influenced their work. Um, I am Justin, the project manager for the Canadian Play Thing, and we're so lucky to have with us today, uh, David Yee and Omari Newton. Um, <clears throat> the Canadian Play Thing is run from Victoria on the unceded territories of the Lokwangan peoples, and I'm currently in Calgary on the land of the Blackfoot Confederacy and the Sutina Nation. Um, tonight, our writers are from Vancouver and Toronto, and I acknowledge the privilege that we have to create and talk about art on this land. Uh, it's also a very strange time right now. So wherever you're tuning in, I hope your folks are well um, and that you're safe. And with that, for those of you that don't know our two amazing writers today, I'm just gonna give a quick bio. Um, we have David Yee is a uh, mixed race playwright and actor born and raised in Toronto. He is the co-founding artistic director of Fujian Theatre Company, Canada's premier professional Asian Canadian theatre company. David is a two-time Governor General's Literacy Award nominee for his plays Lady in the Red Dress and Carried Away on the Crest of a Wave, which won the award in 2015. <clears throat> um, over on the other side, we have Omar Newton, is an award-winning professional actor, writer, director, and producer. Uh, as a writer, his original hip hop theater piece, Sal Capone, has received critical acclaim in multiple productions and including a recent presentation at the Canada National Arts Center. Uh, he has been commissioned by Black Theater Workshop in Montreal to write a companion uh, piece to Sal Capone entitled Black and Blue Matters. So with that, thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, there will be a Q&A at the end. If you have any questions that you think of during the interview, just uh, send them uh, in the YouTube stream or over on Facebook, and I will funnel those to the writers. Um, with that, I will pass it off to Omari to uh, take away our interview. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, hello, David Yee. How are you? I'm well, thank you, Omari Newton. How are you? I'm excellent. Grand. I'm excellent. I keep wanting to say uh, intrepid reporter, David Yee, which is an inside <laughs> joke, but I, <laughs> I want to. Never again. Never <laughs> no, again. never again. Uh, but yeah, I'm really stoked to have this conversation with you. You are an artist and human who inspires me greatly. Uh, I think the first thing that I heard from you, do you remember you came out to Vancouver at the Gateway and you read an excerpt of a piece uh, at the Gateway Theater and Amy and I came to see... Uh, yes. I yeah. I don't I remember do what the remember name that. of the... Do you remember what piece you read? I think I read from a bunch of things, I think. Right. Um, okay. It was like uh, because we were we were also doing um, uh, Lauren Yee's play. We're doing a reading of uh, not the Great Leap, but something else. Right. Um, and uh, and yeah, and I think like while I while I was there, they they hosted like a, a reading evening with me. I think yeah, I think mm -hmm. it was a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. But I remember thinking that your stuff was funny and cutting and there was like an anger a pulse of anger underneath that really resonated with me and i was like this and then we i think we went just to hang out and i was like oh that's who he is that's he's a funny <laughs> guy with anger just deep-seated anger that seething seething anger yeah just just a, a just anger. a core part of him yeah 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 um but I think we're now we're supposed to read uh, a sec. I'm supposed to read a section of my work, and then you're okay. going to read a section of your work, and then we're just going to have a conversation about uh, theater and art. So that sounds good. Yeah, I'll start off. So I've the the one full length play that I've uh, written and has been produced is called Lamentable Tragedy of Sal Capone, uh, and that play I first started writing it in 2008. And this was pre Black Lives Matter movement when I heard about the shooting death of a young black man or a young person of color in Montreal named Freddie Villanueva, who was killed by police. And I was I was so enraged at the time I was, uh, you know, in my 20s and I was so mad about what happened and 
theater is the art form that I've practiced now for most of my, my career. And it, it enraged me that I wasn't seeing these stories that resonated with me on stages. So I wrote this play, Sal Capone, in response to a Canadian incidents of police brutality. And the section I'm gonna read uh, is the, the character's Sal, who is a, a rapper in the hip hop group, Sal Capone, writes a very angry piece where he fantasizes about murdering uh, a police officer as retribution for the death of his friend. It goes like this. Chest down on the grass as I pass by the last white boy in his white picket fence. It's 9.30 BMX, I'm riding dirty white boys under 30, $50,000 Benz. Pulled up in my bike late at night, fuck them pigs in the big wigs with the early morning calls. No graffiti on these walls or misfits, smell of piss in the distance, old beer and puke. Just summer breezes, SUVs, and I'm needing to sew these blue boxes and suits. Ditch my recycled cycle, grip my nine like an MC holds. Acting bad like a Michael down and thriller, creeping like a zombie coming from the ground. Instead of flesh, I search for bacon and it's best served cold as my soul in the winter. Pig pull up in an unmarked truck, press the automatic opener, the door starts to raise. Heart racing, I can see his face and he's facing execution by the cause of retribution. Feel for the cold steel tucked underneath my belt and one swift motion, tear him open, relieve all the pain I've felt. First shot to his leg, he dropped like a tree that's been chopped. No radio chatter, just blood splatter on his freshly paved block. Remove the ski mask, take his gun, stare him in the eyes. Make him beg for his life, but there's no chance he'd survive. Hold his glance long enough that my face is burned into his mind. Then I'd shoot out both of his eyes so the fucking pig would die blind. Then wipe my face clean, but leave the blood upon my hands. And smile to the heavens while my middle finger stands. Revenge so sweet, I give myself diabetes and I'm greedy for another. You won't see me rest in thunder or lightning. I'm frightened, I'm fighting to avenge my fallen brother. Last man down and you can't ever seen another Cause niggas in my hood are living like endangered species Cops shoot no proof, dump bodies like feces Not even cause popo don't really give a shit When we get fed the lead and wind up dead for smoking spliffs No justice, it's just us looking out for one another But yesterday was the last day I'd lose one of my brothers An eye for an eye strike until the murder stop And that's how you kill a fucking cop Punctuated by a very, very loud, aggressive gunshot in the theater I am available nice. for bar mitzvahs, uh, birthday parties, <laughs> like to book me for the various things. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, kids parties. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's all appropriate. Um, man, I like that piece so much. Um, I Okay, so we'll get the reading out of the way. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to read um, a new thing or in progress thing um that used to exist in a different form or in a, a similar form um and it's been kind of redone started to be redone during the uh pandemic um uh and so it's uh it's called um what's it called i gotta scroll up it's called rh thompson's Masterclass or how to become chinese for funding purposes um, and it's, uh, and so it, when it, it opens, it opens with, and it's meant, it's meant to be, you know, on the screen. And so you get the master, the, you know, the masterclass logo with the, um, you know, like, uh, I'm trying to think of like, like Gordon Ramsay or whatever it's, and it, it comes up and it's very classy. Um, and it comes up on our age and he's in uh, a total yellow face with his eyes taped back and he's got a, a, a black bowl cut wig on. And he's talking to uh, an interviewer just off camera, how they do. He says, so <clears throat> uh, what I saw, what we all saw was the, the funding going in, in a new and specific direction, you know, gone were the days of these applications being simple formalities for artists of a certain ilk. And suddenly we were cast out like uh, lepers, like very attractive, square jawed, healthy, immensely talented uh, lepers. The names on the marquees of all the theaters now weren't uh, Don or George or Norm. They were, you know, a Marjorie Chan, a Hiro Kanagawa. But the great writers, the plays are really astonishing works of, of art. And, and they talk about all the Canadian things, the things I've felt myself, to be on the fringes, you know, stigmatized, not feeling represented, not having a voice. For these artists, it's their race, the color of their skin, their language. You know, for me, it's my height, 
I'm six foot three, taller than a heel Oxford, which I wear every day. Only 2.1% of the world is tall, medically tall. I have to be very careful around doorways, chandeliers, the looks I get on the streets, the comments, oh, how's the weather up there? Ignorance. So I connected to these plays, these struggles on, on a very intimate plane. In 1995, I came across a little known play by a Chinese playwright called My Phoenix, My Concubine, The Musical. Now this play, had it all. Song, dance, important cultural references that were easily removed. It employed several oriental theatrical traditions for which I immediately saw the opportunity to translate in, into naturalism. The role of the phoenix spoke to me on a, a visceral level. It was a dream role, like Tom in The Glass Menagerie, but I'd already played him several times. I wrestled with it for hours, finally deciding that I must inhabit the role of the phoenix. There was only one problem. I wasn't Chinese. Yet. You see, there was some precedence for what I was attempting to achieve. Mickey Rooney, Shirley MacLaine, Marlon Brando. They'd all played oriental characters before, but that's all it was, playing. I don't just slap on yellow makeup and tape my eyes back as alleged in the many lawsuits pending against me. That would be offensive. No, this is not makeup. This is a transformation mask. I found a method to not simply play an Oriental, but to claim the Oriental inside me. I found my greatest artistic asset in a long-standing Canadian tradition. We see something that belongs to someone else, and we free it from them so that we can have it. I did play the Phoenix in that production. Brent played the concubine, and we got Norm to do some quick revisions at the whole thing in Muskoka. We just felt a, a Toronto audience would be more at ease with that, and it spoke to the universality of our cultures. That role led to Dora's, Jesse's, a GG for Norm, par for the course, really. The calls started coming in, M. Butterfly, Miss Saigon, Toyota commercials. I'd found my calling. And now I am the highest paid, most frequently employed and critically acclaimed Chinese actor in Canada. Hold your applause. I've never done a class like this before. I've done private coachings, one-on-ones with stars like Emma Stone, Scarlett Johansson, Matt Damon. In this class, I want to share some of my methods, my principles, the the ethos of my artistic practice and the core of transformation mask acting technique. I want to give you the tools to build your own Chinese tea house of the soul. I'm R.H. Thompson, and this is my masterclass. And that's how that... (laughs) Oh, oh. Twisted nightmare of a thing begins. Oh my God, I was laughing very hard. I muted myself, so you know, <laughs> I didn't destroy your piece. Um, that was fine. Was there a specific moment or incident that inspired that hilarious artistic <laughs> job? Um, there was, this is like years and years and years ago, there was this article in the Globe and Mail uh, and it was, a, it was when, um, it was before it was behind a paywall. Um, and it was uh, it was when arts councils started to uh, uh, to prioritize um, uh, people of color and uh, like minority people and and um, uh, uh, and you know all the the priority groups that they that they have now and they started to kind of like publicly uh, say that these are these are going to be our 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 priorities, our funding priorities, and the and it was, which, was, which was great news, um, uh, and you know behind a couple of other people, um, and then the comments on that on that article, I remember one of them, and I, I don't remember it verbatim. I think I have a screenshot of it like somewhere uh, that said, "Okay, so let me get this straight. I want to write a play about uh, like my life as a white guy in Toronto." Denied. Oh, I want to write a play about an Indian woman with one arm. Approved, and like that—that that sort of um, mm-hmm. just the 
there's so much to unpack in that one comment um and it just it it i just kind of like flew into a blinding rage uh because <laughs> because it, it was it was a, a, a litany of them like it wasn't just that one it was oh, you know they, they've blocked the comment sections of most major papers when they in canada at least when they run stories about race they block the comment mm -hmm. section because it's mostly filled with just the most vile insane entitled bullshit you can imagine yeah yeah and uh you know and it hasn't it hasn't gotten any better and i mean i've you hear like you know anecdotally um there's a a a, a friend of mine who does uh self tapes like helps people with self because he's got like a like a studio and a you know or like a, like a studio it was a right. piece yeah. of cloth on on a yeah on a beam um and a camera <clears throat> and uh and so he's you know he gets uh actors who are not actors of color uh coming in and and you know doing their self tapes and uh and there's just such an uptick he was saying of, of their complaints saying that like you know what I, I used to be getting so much you know so many more auditions and now it's all all they want is you know, because I'm not Chinese and I'm not black and I'm not like, what about me? What about my mm -hmm. my struggles as a white man? Um, and that is really becoming like, uh, it's 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 becoming quite endemic of um, of of the industry here. I don't know about Vancouver, but oh, it's the same. Here. I've, I've heard, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I coach actors. Yeah, I, I, the problem has made it to the West Coast as well. But yeah, I coach actors and I, I work with a lot of actors and. You know, work with the union, and there definitely was an uptick in white people complaining about how they went diverse on us, which is, it's one of the funniest fake complaints because the objective evidence that this is not true is on screens all over the world. Like this notion mm -hmm. that like every show is now populated with mostly people of color and like there's no room for for white people is, it's ridiculous. Yeah, you just like just I mean just turn it on and watch it for five minutes. And then go look at who's in the writing room and who's directing them, and then you'll see that you're safe. Mm -hmm. Everything's mm -hmm. everything's okay. It's still the status quo. <laughs> yeah. Now it's interesting. I read a little bit of your bio because I'd like to do my homework. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, mm -hmm. I can't. Yeah. No, no, it's fair. You studied acting, uh, and then very early on realized that playwriting was your calling. Can you talk, like, I, I'm curious to hear what led you to this journey and yeah, how you, how you made that decision. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> lack of, lack of, before, before things had, you know, before uh, uh, all the work had gone diverse, um, there wasn't much work for, uh, for people of color. It was strange. It was a, a long, long time ago. People might not yeah. remember. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> so like when I was in school and like when I, you know, in, in, my the the four years of of my theater school like the first couple of years you do like pretty intensive like scene study and uh and and you get all these like monologue books and stuff and they're all none of it came from my experience right like it was all i wasn't i wasn't reading any sort of work that had anything to do with my lived experience as you know as a as a mixed race person as a chinese person um and uh and the roles that I saw the very few people of color in my program getting who were in the years ahead was like, that's not what I want. I don't, I, why can't we ever be the guy with, with a lot of lines? Um, and so I started writing then uh, in, in uni more as a, uh, a out of self-interest as all, you know, a great calling start. Um, and. Is there uh, another reason to do something? No, I don't think so. I mean, if uh, <laughs> if if Ayn Rand has taught us anything, um, the yeah. So it was like it was it was really uh, it was really kind of born out of out of necessity and just kind of wanting to do more. Um, and and then when I kind of got out into the world, I just, I hated. I just uh, I I didn't like it being at the will and behest of an agent. Um, I, uh, and I wasn't good at it. I wasn't like my, my, my agent was like, you have to really want it. Do you want it? I'm like, sure. Um, cause it's just, it's just, it's just 
I have, I have a lot of, uh, I have a lot of misgivings about a lot of things. Um, but I, uh, I saw this call for uh, plays from Factory Theater, which was doing uh, a, um, a festival called Cross Currents, which was the first uh, festival for um, writers of color. Um, and so I submitted uh, a play that I've been working on at, at, at school um, and it didn't get in, but I was invited into the Playwrights Lab, uh, which is like the, the unit that they have. And it was like, it was me, uh, Hannah Moskovich, Drew Hidden Taylor, um, Kira Loughran, uh, and the other person who I will not name. I just actually can't remember who they are. And that makes me sound like a terrible person. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's confirmed. Um, it, was, it was Julie Tamar, David, and, and now, <laughs> you, now you'll never you'll never work in Hollywood. God damn it! Yeah, sorry. I knew I'd, I knew I'd crossed the wrong person. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and and that just sort of like that was that offered me a lot more a lot more to do and a lot more. I got a lot more out of what I what I put in to it than um, than like a beer commercial. What? So, what? I know. I know. No, I know. So hot take. I, I like the way you phrase that about you got a lot more out of it than you put into it. I, I, I mean, I was, I followed the acting path for a while. I mean, I'm still an actor, but yeah. I find myself. You're a very good to, actor. Yeah, I'm fine. Well, you know, I, <laughs> I, but I, but I mean that genuinely like, and I, I like, and, you know, I also teach, but in a world where like Denzel Washington and Danny Day-Lewis exist, I think everybody needs to like pump their brakes about, how good they think they are, you know, what I mean? or even yeah. like, yeah, yeah. I remember I saw Nigel Sean Williams when I was in my early twenties in Wade in the Water play like 17 different characters in a play, including a 70 year old Southern white man with Parkinson's. And I was like, oh, there's levels to this. And I'm on, I'm not on that one. <laughs> I right. still told Nigel yeah, to this yeah. day. It was one of those moments where I was like, oh, right. There's so much to learn. Anyhow. I saw but, him, and, him, him and Kevin Hancher did uh, Top Dog Underdog and they were fucking fantastic. I've heard, yeah. I didn't get the. I was out, you know, hugging trees on the West Coast, but I, I've heard lots about that production. It was oh, amazing. So good. Yeah. But, you know, I, as I get older, I, I think about my mortality and I think about like the legacy I want to leave behind. And the older I get, the more I think like pouring energy and time into something as fickle as the beer commercial feels gross. Like it feels like it such an epic waste of time. Mm hmm. With the only carrot on offer being a bag of money so I can do what I actually want to be doing, which is like writing or directing things that I give a shit about. Which is you know? which is not necessarily a bad thing. No, you know. like the like taking the bag of money? Yeah, taking the like having a bag of money. If they gave me the bag of money, I would take the bag of money. It's the mm -hmm. getting the bag of money that I've grown more right. resentful of for a thing that I don't want to be doing except for for the bag of money. You're saying, please may I have that bag of money Yes. over the rest of these people who also need this bag of money. Yes, that's the part mm -hmm. that I, yeah, that I've, and then I had, I did this quick math in my head and I said, if I just live a life where I don't need the bag of money, I can just skip that part and do the thing that I want to do. Yeah. I, you... hmm? I said, I don't know how you feel, but. Oh yeah, I mean it's uh, it's it's all I mean it's all different. It's we're we're all asked to do so many fucked up things for such varying sizes of bags and varying amounts of money, and it's like what is what's gonna be fulfilling? Because like I like the thing is I would be I would be writing all this bullshit if. I, if I, if it, if it wasn't a career, like I would find some way to do it because it's how it's, it's how I need to interact with the world. Right. Like I, I don't, I don't know another way to do it. I'm not, I'm not a, uh, I'm not great socially. Um, I, uh, I, 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 I can't play sports. I'm, this is like, this is my contribution. Um, <laughs> and this is, you know, it is, but it's how I, it's how I understand things. Right? Like if I didn't, if I didn't write about stuff, I don't think I'd get very much. I would be a, I'd, I'd be a, a neophyte in the world. So it's, um, 
I think it's it's for the it's for the the better that I I get to um, I get to do it in a professional way because otherwise I'd, I'd just be you know I'd be a quarter of 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 something for you know to to make a living and then the other three quarters of me would be you know living on doing this yeah and was there i mean i don't know did you you seem to have had some degree of success early on you said you submitted to cross cars didn't get in but got invited to the, to the play run unit how soon well how impactful was that and was there a point where or maybe you, if you've reached that now or haven't reached now where you've been like okay like I've I've made it. This is my profession. Like, when were you certain that this was gonna work? Um, I still don't know that it's gonna work. <laughs> I mean, it's like you can't. Like, I'm 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 artistic director of of Fujian, co-founding artistic director, and that's like, it's a it's a a, a company that <clears throat> we all founded together in like 2002. So that's how old I am. Um, but it's also like I. I had that that producerial skill set came from a uh, like self self producing work and like doing like the the fringe and summer works thing like while I was still in in uni and like doing uh, like making those rounds and and finding a way to uh, to to make that work um, and so like that's really like I you know the 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 Joe job gets to also be artistically artistically related and I like and writing is still a part of um what that is but like I I don't like just as a writer I don't know there's there's a very few people who can actually cobble together a career as just a writer here's an interesting point um and this does not come from me this actually comes from Dave DeVoe I just did like two hours of a, a master class before this so I'm like all talked out and my throat's a bit weird and uh and my mind's a bit scattered and I haven't eaten so uh, I start... so that you could be better yeah yeah if... <laughs> learn... did he teach you how to do it yeah if I start to hallucinate then you'll you'll know what's what's happening um sure. but so uh but uh, anyway I was, I was talking with this group of people and 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 Dave DeVoe brought up a really good point which is like for those of us who uh who produce we're we're under new contracts now with everything being uh, being virtual, and you know this, um, mm -hmm. that uh, between now between equity and actor, um, if you're going to be on camera, act, actors are getting paid different rates. They're getting paid actor rates, um, and uh, and and Dave's question, which is a good one, is, well, when am I going to start getting paid film rates? Mm -hmm. When am I going to start like wh Why was Acts of Faith? not a teleplay mm -hmm. like why was i not compensated that way because why it would have uh, why are you not a wgc member now on wgc yeah if 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 actors are are are, are protected and compensated that way then why aren't writers if we don't have a union to fight for us is a simple answer um the more complicated answer is that we theaters can't afford us uh, well, because we were, technically if we're, if that was considered film rights, you should have been paid for having written a feature. Yeah, and uh, and I'll I'll take that. If we sure. could, if we could, if we could be you know compensated commensurate to the um, to, to the work that we put in, um, then I think it would be a much different landscape, and uh, uh, mm. more people would be would be doing different jobs. So you you mentioned um, acts of faith which I mentioned to you before, I think was one of the, you no, know, it was the the first, I think, successful adaptation of the medium of theater to camera. Uh, I, I've watched it a couple times and it, it like, it looked beautiful, it sounded great. And, and even the style of performance seemed to be aware that this was a new thing. So I, I'd love mm. to just talk about like that process of writing a piece for this new medium and what do you think the future of this form of hybrid theater is? Um, yeah, fuck, I don't know. Uh, next question. Um, in, in 30 seconds, solve the okay, future in 30 seconds. Perfect, I can do that. Um, uh, I mean, 
hire hire Natasha Mumba is um, is one thing uh, because you know that's one of the things that she was uh, great at. She's like she's a very very skilled um, uh, theater actor who once she lowered her voice um, was a was a lovely actor on film um, and but like I think was was able to um, to protect. The sort of uh, tenets of um, of live theatrical performance and the like the the construction of like a a, a a a personal and like real like lived emotional reality like around her without the use of um, the uh, the special effects and the budget that we're like uh, so used to um, to uh, to being in in accoutrement of uh, a, a a filmed presentation, right? So like we're, when we see something on the screen, we're like, this is all gonna be made for us in a very, like in, in you know, uh, in stunning verisimilitude of, of real life. Um, but we, we weren't really in pursuit of that. We were, we were looking at preserving how we create realities in the magic of theater um, while uh, not not uh, ignoring that we had to use new technology to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that all became like it was it was a uh, it was it was just sort of like hopeful to to write and um, and very uh, very much sort of relying on my my trust of of Nina as a director and Natasha as a performer and the you know the team that we uh, that we had that we would be able to to figure out how to um, uh, how to how to realize that in a in a way that lifted off the page um, and there was just a lot of collaboration in the room. And like, you know, the, we still, it was still like a process. It was still like, a th- you know, the regular like three and a half week process of, of putting a play up. It was just, you know, all done from the, like with, with a skeleton crew and, and in the, mm-hmm. in the confines of the rehearsal hall at factory. Did you, did you watch uh, takes on the monitor and make adjustments based on what you saw on a monitor or did you watch the actor live? We uh, we did we we tried it a bunch of different ways um, because part of the problem was uh, Natasha getting notes and and hearing feedback and even hearing just like stop like hold, hold for a second while she was performing um, because uh, because of feedback right so if we were like if we were trying to do this on Zoom you couldn't like you could you could uh, mute yourself. Um, but you would be able to hear your own performance coming from other people in the room. So she had to, anyway, it all got worked out to where we were on, uh, some, some people were on zoom, most people were on discord. Um, and, uh, and then alternating through like a, a, a Twitch, um, live stream to, uh, to see how it looked all, uh, all put together. Um, and then managing uh, managing notes and uh, uh, and and massaging moments using a bunch of different platforms instead of just relying on one. Twitch, Discord, and Zoom. You were you're more millennial than any millennial I know. Twitch, I, know. I didn't and even Zoom. know. Like I knew that Twitch existed. I just didn't know why. Right. <laughs> I've never used it. I know. I know that people watch video games on it. But yeah, I, and then like people make like a, a bunch of money on it, and it's like it's it's a thing that I and you know that that would not have been an idea that I had of like right. hey 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 guys guys so we'll watch that asshole play <laughs> fucking Fortnite yeah. and then people are gonna want to watch him like why why would you why would you ever want to do that but it I, but it's a big thing and this I could never have predicted it. Want to hear some? I mean, we off camera we were talking about poker before, and I, when if somebody would have told me in the you know early two thousands or, or, or mid nineties that people watching people play poker would have been a popular thing, I wouldn't it's have believed true. it. It made no sense. And then I, I just heard an interview 
uh, this week, and somebody said that esports currently have higher viewerships than the NBA, the NHL, and the NFL combined. For sure. Esports. And yep. how, so how do we, here now, let me put my producer hat on. How do we get a piece? How do we get a taste in the theater day? How do we get in? We go piece? back in time and we develop fucking video games instead of writing plays and, and making pretend for a living. But I mean, like, but like, okay, video game, this is, video games are escapism. They're mm -hmm. deeply, the good ones have deeply rich stories and characters, right? Why is it that those resonate so deeply with younger generations and theater is, is considered, like, how do we get in on that action of, hey, you know how you like watching the imaginary people doing the things? Yeah. You can do that live if you want. Is it, do we need to put sensors on us and have the audience control us? Is that what it is? Yeah, if we could. I mean, I think that uh, even just uh, um, out, outside of, of of that, I think that it would be a good idea to have somebody else tell us what to do. Um, I, yeah, I don't know, man. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's sort of that, like, it's that, eternal question and if you ask somebody who um who who plays any of that stuff primarily and you know not even tertiarily goes to see theater and you say how can we make this more like that like, oh just make it good um and and that's that's just the answer yeah uh, but i think like we also have a pr problem right like we we have a very serious pr problem in that yeah. it's like theater has been uh, is is museum art for uh, for most people? Yeah, um, it's not it's not something that people in general see in a contemporary light, and it's and that's a lot of like uh, it being lumped in with the opera and the ballet as um, as this like white stuffy uh dated uh, exclusive yeah very like elitist yeah. and we we need to we've always needed to to break out of that somehow um and i think that's what the we we've all been chasing predatorially is how do we how do we do that how do we how do we convince kids the theater is cool like for most of the time it isn't that's the that's the problem <laughs> sometimes it is though amy and i went to new york for the first time last year there was a world remember the world where you could jump on a plane and you could just fly places and you could be in crowds of people it was, it was really... i do i do remember that fondly so we we did that uh, and we went to see uh, the ferryman on Broadway. And first of all, just hanging out in like cafes, just off Broadway or, you know, it was the first time that I was like, oh, all these people are stoked for their night of going to see plays. Like everybody sitting there. And I was like, this is so surreal. I would never experienced that where people just were like, this is a cool thing to do on a Saturday night. And that production of the ferryman that we saw, I would hold up against any movie theater experience I've ever had in terms mm. of the, the strength of performances, of the, the script, the production value. And it just, I mean, I, I know part of that is like budget, like Broadway has budgets that most Canadian theater companies can't compete with. But I was trying to figure out like, what is it? Why did this resonate so hard, you know? And it comes back to what you said. It, it was um, good. <laughs> It was um oh, what is a technical word for it? Not sucky. Um yeah, there's there's that. There's also the, there's like like Broadway in New York has its own like culture of of theater. There's like there's a culture of theater going. Um it has its own uh and things like Chicago has that as well, like its own um uh its own like niche audience that is that is not elitist and is not um uh like old and and stuffy but is like you know there is there's a a breath of like of of young life to it 
um, that we, I think we lack anywhere that isn't New York or Chicago. <laughs> And things like the idea is that you have to go to those places to see the theater that is good enough to rival uh, going to a movie theater or uh, playing esports. That like that stuff only exists in those localities. That it is like geographically isolated somehow, and that it couldn't possibly exist um, in you know your neighborhood, which is is categorically untrue. But it's what we. Uh, I think have been have been conditioned to believe mostly by the people who run Broadway. <laughs> right. And um, the Goodman. Um, yeah. Yeah. But have you? So you know, I think humbly that you write plays that are good. I saw it carried away in the Crescent Wave, and I thought that was very good. And I, you know, and so my question. Have you found when you do something that you're proud of that has that where the stage represents, you know, in terms of what people look like, the world that you live in, have you found that it draws in more people than the average theater goer? Has that have you seen an impact? Uh no. <laughs> I I oh, wish oh. I could say yeah. Okay, well thanks a lot. Um <laughs> great talking with you. I mean, I, 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 I wish I, I wish I could say it, it, I, I had, and I, I wish I could say that it does, and I wish that you know you could be like, hey guys, the answer is is this. Now let's everybody do that, and uh, if you build it, they will come. Um, but it's, it's, the the answer is so much more complex than I think like anything that we're that we're addressing one thing at a time. Um, but I think it's also just like it's my uh it's it's my work um i've never uh i i had i remember going to see paper series and paper series at that time was like the best reviewed show that i that i had up it's like cahoots did it in 20 something um and uh and it got it got good reviews and so i went to the theater to check it out thinking they're like all right cool that's gonna like translate into like people checking it out and I and I walk in and there's like eight people, and and like three of them knew me. So when I walked in, they're like, "Oh, hey!" And I'm like, "Don't say, don't draw more attention to the fact that that is like, yeah. watching my yeah. own show, the ninth member of this audience." Um, I just uh, directed a production of No Child at the Arts Club, and um, it it was a struggle to get people in. No. The excuse that I keep using is that we're in a pandemic and people were respecting COVID protocols. I think I think that's a that's a pretty good excuse. I think it's a great excuse. <laughs> Although the the bar across the street and the, the sports restaurant and the sports bars were packed, uh, which that was like a nice kick in the nuts while I was going to the theater and seeing nobody there. Yeah. And we got great reviews. We got lot we got lots of coverage first of all because nothing else was really going on. <laughs> Like yeah, national, that'll do it. Yeah, and then, and still, people were like, "No, I'll watch literal reruns of Canucks playoffs games at a bar," but yeah, but not go into a theater. And I think it comes back to this perception that's not cool. Yeah, but there's, I mean, there's also this, it's a different crowd of people who are going to bars uh, in person during a pandemic um, than the people who would attend theater. I think we um, we want we're we're asking different things of them. Yeah, yeah. Um, we are not the escapism that uh, that, that Johnny Walker provides, um, though. Though I think sometimes we try to be. I, I would argue that Johnny Walker in theater is an excellent night, but that's just me. <laughs> uh, we have a question from the audience. We do. Uh, we have an audience. We have, we, first of all, we have an audience. Second of all, we have questions. Christy says, what has been the largest growing experience for you as playwrights? And what do you wish your younger uh, selves knew that you do not know now? You go first. Hmm. Uh, I, I feel like my largest growing experience uh, was getting to work with Black Theater Workshop and getting to work with a company who, who th their mandate and their very name was, they were, their existence is to support 
a work of black writers and having a company like that champion and help develop a new voice was an incredible growing experience. And, you know, if what I wish I knew when I was younger was that like, like how hard this is, you know, I, the, the, there's something to be said about the arrogance of youth being like, ah, I can, I can write a play. Yeah, anybody can do that. Yeah. Just how, how hard it is and how, like, you know, truly my, my wife, Amy Lee Lavoie is my favorite playwright. And I, I fell in love with her largely because of her work. And I, and people don't appreciate the craft required for the illusion of simplicity in dialogue and honesty in dialogue and even making someone laugh with words is so hard. And I, I learned that, yeah, through trial and error. I'm still yeah. learning that. And though. I mean, and and uh, Amy's also, one, not not to be outdone by you, her husband. Um, <laughs> also one of my favorite writers. Um, and yeah, and does like does make it look easy because she 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 you know she lays the line down in the you know in the way that we are in, with with a virtuosity that um, I I think is is impressive but is uh, by no means easy, right? No. Is not like is not like is 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 a is a gift, but that doesn't make it uh one that is uh that is easily given um yeah yeah, yeah. i mean it's it is it's it's, it's but it'd be, if it it's like that industry wide though you know like acting i make fun of actors a lot but like it's not it it, it isn't easy um it's it's like you you're you're going and you're making me pretend you you know the film and tv people will have they got lunch given to them and shit but it's it's still not easy it's still you're still pulling like really long fucking hours and you're 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 worked to the bone you have to you have to pretend it's summer when it's winter and it's like um it's it's misery a lot of what we do is is misery under the guise of ease um and pleasure <laughs> yeah um so yeah, yeah. I probably want to. I don't think I had the arrogance that it was that it was easy though. Um, I mean, I, I had different arrogance. Um, I, uh, I, I think I wish that I, I wish that I'd known it was possible mm-hmm. because I didn't know I didn't know that you could do this for a living. Like I didn't come from an arts family. I didn't like I, you know it was. Yeah. It was all just sort of, and we didn't have the internet because, again, I'm that old. Um, we, we, you sort of had to like learn as you went, and I, yeah, I didn't, I, I, I wasn't aware that this was something that was a viable career choice, mm-hmm. or I might have done some things differently. Yeah. I feel like you keep saying you're old. I feel like we're close to the same age. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Yeah. You're, you're a bit younger than me. Okay, All right. but we are we are close. Uh, I'm okay. I'm also insulting you when I say that I'm old. Well, I'm that's what I'm, I'm dragging that's why you I'm down with me. I will not be yeah. spoken to like that on this level. <laughs> <laughs> so we had another question. Karma said, "What advice would you have for players who are just starting out?" And I, I'll, I'll I can go first. Actually, I, I know that like Nina Leakino has been a big champion for you, and does she dramaturge your work as well? Uh, yeah, uh, mostly, yeah. And Diane Roberts has, has been my Nina Lee Aquino. She's we have a company together, and she's she dramaturged Sal Capone and now Black and Blue Matters. I would say, pray to find somebody who knows what they're doing, who believes in you, and will will keep you on this straight and narrow path. Because writing is hard, and you're going to want to quit repeatedly, and you need someone to kick your ass. Probably, that's my advice. Yeah, my my advice is learn a skill trade. Um, like bicycle fixing, uh, woodworking, something useful. Um, um, I don't know. Uh, uh, Bukowski, Bukowski has this, uh, great quote when he was asked by, um, the, the mother of a young artist, what advice that he had for her, for her son. He says, uh, don't try, uh, not for, for Cadillac's lumen or fame. Because art is like a fly on the wall. Yeah, sometimes you have to wait for it to come to you. My so advice. don't try. That's my advice. Okay, good. All right. Uh, 
Lily would like to know, what are some tactics you use to push through a slump in your writing process? Uh, I mean, I think Jack Daniels. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. But also, no, I'm not even a big drinker. That's not true. I I don't know. I, it takes me a really long time to write. I feel like I, I can't even answer that question. What do you What do you do to push through your slumps, David? You, you're very successful, um, right? I I, uh, I I just I deprive myself of uh, food and water until um, until I have you know uh, at least five pages, and then I, I allow myself to to eat and drink again. It just becomes a a way of staying alive. That's not true. Um, but, ser but serious question though: Are you a page count guy, or an or like set hours guy, or like set time guy? What's your process? Uh, I'm I I am I'm wait for wait for the fly to come to you guy. Hmm. Um, if I if I sit there for eight hours and I I only get half a page or like or no pages, then that has to be okay because it's going to be okay when I sit there for eight hours and I get you know thirteen pages. Um, it's all as long as it's as long as I'm not fucking off and uh, and watching the amazing race. Um, by the way, season three winners, Flo and Zach, just the worst. Like Zach was great, but Flo never have I wanted to murder somebody more. Um, uh, we, we've been on the bachelor in our house, so I don't I, I don't know. From the oh, God, race. I can't. I can tell you, Bennett's a serial killer. For anybody who watched The Bachelor, you'll know what I'm saying. Bennett is a serial killer, and one day we're going to be watching a Dateline episode about him. Sorry, it was not the same Bennett. It was that was on the um, the the Love Is Blind one, right? I don't know. Amy, okay, is it there was a guy named. Oh no, Amy says no. Okay, it's a different guy. All right, hi, Amy. Um... <laughs> this is Sorry. fascinating I... TV for anybody. What they're like? Oh, there's a voice. Should um, we actually? Did I actually answer that question? Um, I don't. The the slumps you just you stick to you you stick with it, um, and and try to try to not be hard on yourself, because it's hard right now to create. Like nothing nothing feels worth it. Nothing feels uh, creative. Nothing feels joyful um, anymore, and it hasn't for the past nine months. Mm -hmm. And that's we just have to live in that reality. Uh, I mean, jokes, jokes aside, for real, I, I don't know anyone else listening at home or for, for you, I've been struggling with, with depression throughout this pandemic and creative blockage. Like, I don't know how any sensitive person right now isn't looking at the state of the world, whether it's from a health standpoint or social justice and doesn't feel a crippling sense of like existential dread. Yeah, crippling sense of existential dread is like is pretty much my, like if if we if people still did like their like Facebook updates like David is is feeling I mean like crippling feeling of existential dread. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Monday, like it's, it's all true. like every everything is like every fucking day is a Monday, and um and 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 everything just brings you closer to this uh this this horrible state of anxiety where you're considering not just your own mortality but those are the ones that you love yeah. um yeah i i think woody allen said this in the interview once that he said something crazy like if you think about it in a hundred 150 years from now every single person on the planet today will be gone will be dead there'll be a, a new a, entire reset Every 150 years, just got, and then for some reason it really hit me, and I was just like, "Wow, that's true!" Like, so all the all the like whatever awards or you know stocks or houses or whatever it is that people collect, you know, to distract themselves from the, the slow decline, it doesn't matter. And I guess I guess if you got kids, you pass it on to them. But if not, it's just that was fun. Now you're a blip in, in history, and then yeah. that is a drop. I mean, I guess I guess what I'm leading to is asking you: Do you? Do you think about legacy and what you want that to be? Um, I uh, I don't. I actually I, uh, I I never I never have. And I think I wonder if if some of that is um, is 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 just you know a, 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 a Buddhist principle of you know just you know having no attachments and um, and and not. Uh, 
uh, not believing that I that I actually own anything. That this is you know that that everything is uh, is is temporary and everything is illusory and um, there what legacy doesn't in the end it doesn't matter. It's not a it's not a real thing. Like it doesn't. Um, yeah, it, like it, it, it doesn't it, it doesn't do the world any greater good. Um, if uh, if if the work continues on, if people are, are are reading my stuff after I'm dead, then that's that has more to do with them than it has to do with me. And I think if you if 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 you look at if you look at that scenario and you think about your legacy, then uh, then that says more about you than it does anything else. All this and more on the next podcast entitled Why I'm a Narcissistic POS. Because all I think about <laughs> all fucking think legacy. <laughs> my legacy, but not in the <laughs> but not in the like they will erect statues in my but I just go like, I don't know, we all know when you hear of somebody pass away who not even necessarily a famous person, and everybody's kind of like, Yeah, that, that dude was a piece of shit. Like, you know, like I and I'm like I I'm constantly my my aim is to when I pass whenever that time may be for people to at least be like he was a good dude you know what I mean and that's not even connected to I, I mean it is connected to art in some way because I yeah I don't know yeah I think that just has more more to do with like not wanting to be an asshole though which is different than like wanting to have you know a a a, a, a you know uh and 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 immortality in the uh in in the way of like a pervasive legacy like you just don't want people to think that you were a dick and that's fine i mean i don't think you're, i'm gonna remember you as a nice guy i'm gonna be gone way before you but yeah, i you know i need my place to keep reminding people that day but because when you when you're when you and, and james cater are gone who's gonna tell people how great i am <laughs> uh, that's right those are we're the last people who like you so i know, I know. yeah it's hard out here um, there's, there's another question. Uh, where did you submit your work as an emerging playwright? Um, factory theater. <laughs> um, I yeah, just like uh, some places that had. I mean, there, there, there. There's a lot more now. There's a lot more uh, places to send your to send your stuff, especially if you're like if you're young and emerging. There's like because of these like. Uh, priority groups that were introduced by by funding bodies and because people were making uh, well-funded companies care about um, people of color and, and young people, there's a lot more um, opportunities to uh, to send your work out to get looked at by professionals. Um, so uh, yeah, I just didn't I didn't do anything because it didn't exist. Yeah, I mean it, it's true. There is a lot. I mean, there's so many uh, incubators now, and I mean, even mm -hmm. all like the PGC that would give you a list of festivals and whatnot. But yeah, there's a lot more options. Oh, hang on, we had another question here. Uh, looking forward. I don't believe to that that many people are watching. That's a lot of questions yeah, I mean, for I like what I would imagine is just like three people and like Amy. But it's three very curious people. And here's one of oh, someone, uh, there's there's actually 16 people watching, David. So wow. there you go. Uh, looking forward at, at your career. You're really pulling the crabs. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this is more people than came to the entire run of No Child. Uh, looking forward at your careers. <laughs> what skills are you excited or hoping to learn one day? Theater related or not. It could be bicycle fixing, woodworking, anything useful. David, you, first of all, I'm mad at you for giving away my exit strategy by mentioning bicycle fixing. That was going to be my, the market I had cornered. You had to come on here and tell people. I thought I thought you were going to go into um, uh, a financial consultation. Um, yeah. Once I get the money from the bike fixing. <laughs> right. Right. Sorry. I, I should have I should have put two and two together. Uh, system. System. <laughs> yeah. You know, I need one to get the other. You got to get up before you can get down. Right. Um, that's what they say. Uh, oh, what skill I'm, um, 
do I have the capacity to gain more skills? Can you teach an old dog new tricks? Um, I suppose I'm really, I've, what's funny is that like we have this whole kind of bit, this, this whole, you know, Newton and Yee comedy bit on, um, on Twitch and, and video games, because I basically, I didn't play video games. Right. So like the last video game, when like it was like 8-bit Nintendo I was like oh video games are cool and then it got it got really complicated and went I can't do this I don't have the hand-eye coordination nor uh the attention span and so like it just everything just blew past me this whole like like World of Warcraft like all this stuff just did not register to me I like to shoot things in an arcade that's pretty much it um but then we land in VR that has all these like performance possibilities in it mm-hmm. and just because um i of my relationship with uh the hong kong exilers um uh that all like that sort of like landed on on my radar and so like i'm you know we're we're at, at fujian we're looking into especially with this like whole you know digital um uh, situation that we find ourselves in looking at you know vr and performance so i'm i'm looking forward to figuring out what that is. It's funny, I don't know if you know, but I took part in a, a pathetic fallacy that was a Milton Lim design. Yeah, Anita Vachon's. And I was I was blown away, man. Like that dude, is, Milton Lim knows his, his shit. Those Hong Kong exile guys got it going on. So I think You're that's okay. cool. Yeah, I mean, I'm just saying this because we're live right now. I really, actually, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I don't think this. I don't think it'll get back to him if you tell him that. I heard they eat children. <laughs> but, but yeah, I think some hybrid of that is where is where we're heading. So I would, I mean, to answer the question about skills, look, anything that can help you navigate the virtual world is going to be in high demand. You know, I, whether it's writing for this medium, which has been happening for a long time, whether it's film or TV or video games, or I would just say diversify your skill set so that you you can you, i mean already there's skills transferable outside of theater but be more deliberate about it i guess um so we we're basically at time now david so are we yeah yeah it's a it's 6 16 so we're, okay. we're over time we're over time uh, we're over we're over achievers yeah to thank you uh for you know agreeing to to do this and truly you are an artist who really inspires me i i learned a lot today and i i'm gonna like take some of these nuggets and learn how to fix bikes um (laughs) it's i mean it's really i think it's really useful where where you are because everybody they like riding bikes there the seawall that's something i bought one i live in the west end i bought a bike at the start of the pandemic and it's been on the same spot on my balcony since i bought it you know what? The, when I was in when I was in Vancouver doing whatever show I was doing there, um, I, I I I borrowed a bike from a friend of Milton's. Like it, like I was I was hooked up, um, and uh, and I, I parked it outside my hotel. And on the third day I was there, it was stolen. Yeah, I you should have called me before you did that. I could have <laughs> I could have you know. I could have told you that that definitely would have happened. I felt so bad. If I, I mean, I, I don't like, anymore. I did then. As a Vancouver guy, not giving you the heads up on that, I feel like that's on him. You know, bike theft is. You know what? You're right. It is his fault. Yeah. Thank you. Never, guys, you listening, never take responsibility. If something doesn't go the way you want it to go, pass the buck. <laughs> this is think- important life advice. <laughs> I think with, with that note, <laughs> um, we'll start to close it off there. <laughs> um, I'm just, I, I could just keep listening to this conversation, but um, I just had a couple questions for both of you. I wonder if there's anything coming up that you wanted to pitch um, to the audience, things that you're working or stewing. Um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, in I think in February, I'm... Uh, I'm writer in residence at a U of T and I'm writing a a series of uh, audio plays for them. Um, And so that'll be, I think they will be available as like podcasts or something in uh, February, March-ish. Nice. Um, 
my my wife Emily Lavoie and I are co-writing a bunch of stuff. Uh, we're, we're, we we co-wrote a play called Redbone Coonhound, which is a, a satirical piece about race, uh, and we are adapting Titus Andronicus from a uh, anti-racist, militant black and radical feminist lens. But it's also funny to share it with hip hop in it. I, I just. Give me a ticket right now. I'll go see it. Let's see. You're really good at marketing the that uh, uh, what you do. Oh, thanks. Or at least like making it sound interesting. I gotta when I talk about paper series, I'm like, I got a show. It's six monologues about paper. And then I just watch you. And I really can't be that surprised that nobody came to see it. Well, David, that's because I I don't have a Governor General's Award, so I have to <laughs> <convince> people. <laughs> I need to do a lot of selling, a lot of like, you're going to love it. You know, if I had, a DVD, I would just be like, I'm doing a thing. And they would come and it's hard out here. It is. <laughs> awesome. Justin, are you going to uh, cut us off? Uh, I might have to, even though I don't want to. But um, I have three, um, like one word, quick questions for both of you. Uh, favorite spot inside a theater, specific or general? center back uh, left like in the, in the middle like middle section so that i got the aisle on my on my right side oh i like my uh, i like the aisle on my left side awesome. i'll yeah i'll i'll on the left and closest closest to a door <laughs> in case you have to go or no it's just like it, because when when everybody is like yay it was great i don't want to be there when they turn around um, gotcha. Tarragon actually has a really good escape hatch right next to the booth that you can just like open a little door and go through while they're doing curtain call and nobody notices. Oh, nice. Now they know your secret though, but... <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and then favorite play of all time. If, yeah. Oh, shit. Mm. That's a tough one. Actually, no, it's not. I'm lying. This is a weird one, but Suburbia by Eric Bogosian. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah. It, no, you're that's, Montreal, right? That's the play that made me want to to write dialogue. I'll go from from that the the uh, the the one that made me that made me want to write, or at least made me think that it was possible, was uh, Fronteras Americanos uh, by Guillermo Verdecchia. Hmm. I haven't heard of them, but I'll definitely look it up. And then the last one is. Uh, Sorry. What is the one word that you're always cutting out of your uh, drafts? I mean, probably fuck. I swear a lot as a person and in my right, like excessively. And it's weird because I'm not like cool or a badass or anything like that. I just swear a lot. Uh, I think like. I, um, I, I, yeah. I, and and other little conjoiners. Um, I try to. Say, I leave all the fucks in. I said I said fuck during my 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 GG exception speech, um, where I apologized to my mother for the, the, that my character said fuck so much. <laughs> and then the the Mrs. Mrs. Governor General went. I like it when you swore. It was really cute. Nice. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, with that, I think we're about to go off air. Thank you, both of you, for doing this interview um, and to our audience for joining us today. Um, this event was supported by the Canadian Playwrights uh, Guild and also the Canada Council for the Arts. Um, and then finally, if you are an emerging or early career writer and you have a Canadian playwright that has influenced you in some way, uh, feel free to send us an email um, at projects at plaything.ca. I'll leave a, a link and uh, we'll try to sort something out. Thanks everybody for joining us. Thanks Thank for you. having us and thanks for asking. Yeah, of course, man. All right, man. Yeah. All right, we'll, uh, we'll, 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 we'll chat soon. Yeah.